Hello, welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. Back in 2016, we lost a comic book creator that I consider a giant in the industry. He was somebody that could clearly express emotion and action. He had a clean retro style that was easily identifiable. I'm talking about Darwin Cook, who was beloved by both his fans and his peers. I had the pleasure once of speaking with Darwin for an extended period of time about comic books, and it was both fun and enlightening. A real privilege. Today, I want to take a look at his career and how his background in design and animation influenced his creative impulses. We're going to take a look at some of his work from when he broke in, a work from the middle of his career when he was at the height of his powers, and an issue or two from his final days. So this may be a little bit sad. Uh, you know, he was a really wonderful creator that I love very much. Before we go too far, please do consider hitting like and subscribe. That really helps the channel out. But without any further ado, let's get into talking about Darwin Cook. Born in Toronto, Canada in late 1962, Darwin fell in love with comic books at an early age. And according to interviews he gave to the Comics Journal and Comics Alliance, Darwin began copying his favorite Spider-Man and Batman comics as early as age 13. He ultimately submitted his artwork to DC Comics in 1985 and was assigned a five-page story in New Talent Showcase number 19. The work here is a fascinating contrast to his work in later years. It's a wordless story that compares favorably with his later crime comics in how it uses heavy shadows and clear, efficient panel-to-panel -panel storytelling. And yet, it's much more detailed and in a way more generic. Perhaps a story like this would have set his standards for comic book artwork, but he opted not to continue working in comics. Darwin was earning only $35 per page, and it took him a full week to do a single page. So he just felt that he was not going to be able to make money in this career. So he went back to Toronto, Canada, and began working in magazines as an art director, as a designer, and that was his life for the next 10 years. But in 1996, he found a way back into comics, or at least working on superheroes. In 1996, Darwin saw an ad in the Comics Journal looking for storyboard artists on the Batman animated show. Darwin submitted 14 pages of a Batman story, which went on to be published by DC in 2000 as part of an original graphic novel. In the meantime, Cook spent three years in LA, where he storyboarded four episodes of the new Batman Adventures, some episodes of the Superman animated series, Justice League, and even created the opening for Batman Beyond. One of his best pieces of work was adapting Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns into an animated sequence for the show. Darwin made connections in the animation scene in LA and also worked as a director on Men in Black. It was while he was at this stage of his career that he came back to comics. DC Comics editor Mark Chiarello was going through old pitches in 1999 and came across Darwin's storyboard submission. They worked together to make Darwin's original Batman comic, Batman Ego, which came out in 2000. Ego is a confident story where Bruce Wayne must reconcile his identity between himself and Batman. The story begins with Batman getting information from one of Joker's henchmen, only for Batman to later save the henchmen from a suicide attempt. Convinced that the Joker would torture his family, the henchman reveals he killed them himself as a mercy before shooting himself in front of a horrified Batman. Bleeding heavily from an encounter earlier that night, Bruce returns to the Batcave and confronts his alter ego, where they argue about who is the true version of Bruce Wayne. The story is a slightly more adult version of what you might have been able to see in the animated series of the 90s. Cook has rebuilt his artistic style to be more simple and to draw on the aesthetics of the 1950s architecture, film, and advertising. I haven't been able to figure out which of the 14 pages in Batman Ego came from that original submission. I would love to know that, but I haven't been able to figure that out. Looking at Batman Ego, I wouldn't say that it is my personal favorite work by Darwin Cook, but it is interesting. It's interesting 
to look at the Bruce Wayne Batman dichotomy and to look at the distinctions between what makes him scary and what makes him a hero. So I do think it is well worth a read for any fan of Batman. And the following year, Darwin Cook would begin to explore other untapped areas of the Batman universe. Beginning in 2001, Darwin Cook teamed up with writer Ed Brubaker, then a relatively new talent at DC. They began a four-part backup story in the pages of Detective Comics starting in issue 759. That story followed Detective Slam Bradley being asked to track down Catwoman, who supposedly had been killed. Slam Bradley is a character that predates Superman and Batman, first showing up as a street-smart investigator in the pages of Detective Comics No. 1 as a creation of eventual Superman creators Joe Shuster and Jerry Siegel. Brubaker and Cook combined to give us a good mystery story with a retro sheen. It's a great fit, and Cook gives Bradley a clever, tough, and world-weary demeanor with just a few craggy lines. This splash page from the fourth part is one of my favorites, where Slam is being held upside down and all of the text boxes are similarly printed upside down. A great use of the medium of comics, since it was simple enough to flip it around to read it. Brubaker's dialogue and story turns have always been top-notch, as he continues to prove to us with his crime comics that he regularly creates with artist Sean Phillips. Darwin Cook's art is more cartoony than Phillips by comparison, but they both know how to draw tough guys, femme fatales, and drench their settings in noir-inspired shadows. That story led into a new Catwoman ongoing series by Brubaker, with Cook handling art duties for the first four issues. One thing Cook brought to the table here was a classiness to Catwoman's sex appeal. Her prior series had largely been illustrated by Jim Ballant, who loves drawing well-endowed ladies. Cook's ladies are far more realistic than those, but they also often look different from one another, which is a huge asset. Darwin's character redesigns for Selina Kyle, Catwoman's civilian identity, were modeled after Audrey Hepburn, vintage 60s-era outfits. And her Catwoman suit was similarly redesigned to be a sleek catsuit like one you'd see in 60s-era spy shows such as Avengers. One key difference was that he added night vision goggles that angle up towards her tiny cat ears. It seems like it must have been the overriding influence when designing Catwoman for the Christopher Nolan movie Dark Knight Rises. The four issues of Catwoman with Darwin doing the art feature her deciding who she wants to be as she gets to start with a clean slate. She redesigns her outfit, and she seems to have genuine fun bouncing around the city rooftops at night. Darwin's line work is deceptively simple as he invents exciting angles with great perspective work and superior gesture and expression work to help us understand who the character is without relying on the dialogue. Another exciting piece of Darwin's work are his montages, such as this one, that effectively conveys an elevated subway train at night, taking some motion cues from the work of Bernard Krigstein and adding in a silhouetted Catwoman that wouldn't feel out of place on the Batman animated series. Diverse influences blending seamlessly. The issues are inked by Mike Allred, whose artwork on stuff like Madman evokes a similar 1960s influence when it comes to buildings, cars, hair, and clothing. It's a great match, and meeting Allred would prove beneficial to an upcoming project by Darwin. But first, he wrote and illustrated the graphic novel Selena's Big Score, detailing the events of what Catwoman was up to just before her new ongoing series debuted. It's less of a street crime level story like the Catwoman ongoing, and more of an exotic heist movie. It's gorgeous, and it's worth noting that Darwin himself said in a 2007 interview with the Comics Journal that it was the, quote, single thing I did that I liked the most. In 2004, DC began publishing a six-issue series written and illustrated by Darwin Cook called The New Frontier. It is simultaneously a love letter by Darwin Cook to the DC superheroes that he grew up with and his love for the art and design style of post-war America. It is a superior piece of storytelling, and I believe that it belongs in whatever list you want to make of all-time best DC Comics stories.
The New Frontier is a challenging comic to summarize because it focuses on a wide host of DC superheroes, but the central premise involves following them from 1945 through 1960. The central conceit is that the story is passing in real time, and we follow Golden Age characters like Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman as the newer Silver Age characters get introduced, and they appear in the timeline at the same time that they debuted in print for the first time. The story focuses on America's changes in this tumultuous time, from race relations to the space race with Russia. Two of the most prominent characters we follow include Hal Jordan, who eventually becomes Green Lantern, and John Jones, the Martian Manhunter. Hal Jordan is a Korean War veteran and test pilot who becomes roped into the space race. Martian Manhunter represents an alien, a minority, trying to understand America from an outsider's perspective. Darwin spoke with fellow artist Mike Allred, who previously served in the Air Force, for details on how to present Hal Jordan. Our heroes are placed in compromising positions where they have to navigate enemies both foreign and domestic, from communist nations to racism and bigotry at home. It's a story with some dark edges, so it helps that Darwin's slick style lightens the tone a bit. There are clear influences in the artwork from artists like Jack Kirby and Alex Toth, but Darwin is in complete control as the storyteller here, primarily operating in pages with three tiers of panels. It creates a consistent pacing where something is introduced, paid off, and there is a reaction whenever it's time for action. And with the consistency of the three-tier structure, it means that when Darwin wants to slow down the action with a double-sized panel or a splash page, it's rendered that much more effective. Similarly, there are occasional story beats that will break the action down into a smaller grid of panels to imply a speed to the actions that we're used to seeing take place in just one panel. There is a lot of delicate character work, with some heroes like Superman working for the government, while others, like Wonder Woman, become disenfranchised by America's political goals. It's a story of outsiders trying to find their place in the world, but what makes them heroes is that they're always ready to set their ego aside when they have the ability to help others. The story closes out with John F. Kennedy's famous New Frontier speech. Darwin Cook said he always had that in mind, not to endorse everything Kennedy did, but that it was an appropriate and moving speech for its time because it was a well-articulated promise of what modern America could offer. New Frontier gets my strongest recommendation, and in 2019, DC published through their Black Label this edition that collects not just the 400-page story, but also an additional 100 pages of Darwin Cook's annotations, of his character designs, of things like an additional story. Let's see if we can get to that. Um, so it's a tremendous value and a rare insight into the creative process. This era featured Darwin at the height of his powers with some fill-in issues at Marvel, including a sweet Christmas story for Spider-Man that he inked over frequent collaborator Jay Bone's pencils, and the story and art for Solo Number 5. Solo was an anthology published by DC, allowing creators to experiment Darwin's issue uses Slam Bradley as a framing device for several smaller crime stories, and it won him the Eisner Award for Best Single Issue. If there's any comic that shows off Darwin Cook's capabilities, it's this issue of Solo. From his design sensibilities, to stories that highlight his sense of humor, to stories showing off his pared-down artwork for dark and gritty crime stories, Solo features Darwin Cook's scope and depth, but unites it all with an energy and a sense of motion few artists can capture. And while there are many comic books that are worthy of analysis that Darwin Cook made from his collaborations with other professionals on books like Jonah Hex and The Twilight Children through Image, the one that I want to focus on now is the final few comics that he did in his career. They were a series of crime stories that he published through IDW. They were an adaptation of the Parker novels. And crime comics are just one of my favorite genres, so it's what connected the most with me. The Parker novels were written by Donald Westlake under the pseudonym Richard Stark, and he wrote 24 pulp crime novels about the man known only as Parker. 
Darwin Cook liked the dark narratives and appreciated the economy of words in Westlake's prose. Westlake would only include the minimum detail necessary, which by necessity meant Cook would have to interpret some of the story for a visual medium. The character of Parker is that of a career criminal with few redeeming qualities other than the fact that he's a professional. He abuses women, drinks, and is very violent. He often would be involved in a heist that would go wrong, and in the first graphic novel, The Hunter, he's out for revenge. Darwin doesn't show us Parker's face for a long while, just showing us a hulking but rough-looking man trudging his way into New York City. We finally see Parker, and Darwin's adapted his style for the tone of this story, using a one-color process to desaturate Parker's dark world. The line art is blocky and angular, with attention to period detail, but not much care for specifics. Instead, we focus on the character of Parker as he forges a false identity to drum up some quick cash, clean himself up, and get ready for revenge on his wife who betrayed him to the one of his crew, and to get his money back. Criminal or not, Parker was wronged, and the viewpoint aligns with the character as he methodically works his way up the chain of command to get revenge on the criminals he worked with. This is probably not a story for everyone. It's brutal. Parker is no hero. He's really unlikable. It all depends on what kind of mileage you get out of heist stories or revenge stories. I like that stuff. I understand not everybody does. Darwin Cook actually had plans to do more than the four adaptations he did, but sadly he passed away rather quickly in 2016 from an aggressive form of cancer. And he left behind other unfinished projects like a planned series at Image. It's a real disappointment to me that we didn't get to see too many original characters and stories by Darwin Cook. He did a lot of adaptations or working for DC or Marvel. I would have loved to have seen more original ideas from him. The closest we probably get there is the Twilight Children that he did with Gilbert Hernandez. So that's definitely uh, worth looking at if you want to try to get inside his mind and, and understand his character work a little bit better. Um, I love Darwin Cook's aesthetics. But it's not for everybody, and there are some criticisms about them. So I'm going to first take a small break to show you what fan art came into the channel this week, and then I'll come back to address some of those critiques. Brother Yeti illustrated me getting eaten by a dinosaur. You can see more by him on Instagram. Lou Baker drew a version of me as Thanos, wrinkly chin and all. There's more by Lou on Instagram. Jake McLean reimagined the World War II propaganda comics with myself and Infotron behind the guns. Brian Long also picks up on that patriotic spirit of the World War II comics, showing us what I'd be like as Uncle Sam. Roma Ticklin sent in this artwork where I get to be Spider-Man versus his many enemies. David Katharima from Kenya illustrated me as the Ghost Rider. You can see more by him on DeviantArt. Dr. Ghazi says that he's 11 years old and imagined me meeting his original character. Chebich drew me and civilian justice as an homage to the famous Raphael Albuquerque Batgirl cover. Mahmoud Elzane from Sudan shows what happens when you read too many Hulk comics. Folks, I'm always happy to share any artwork that has something to do directly with comic tropes. If you'd like to have something like that featured, you can just send it in to this address, comictropes at gmail.com. I'll feature it. And then I like to, while supplies last, pick a gotchapon prize for one of those entrants. Not too many left. I'm going to be phasing this out because it is taking a lot of my time and effort to actually mail these things these days. Um, but I'm still happy to always share the artwork. And by the way, let me just throw in a quick plug right now for my Patreon. Uh, I do have a Patreon where I have exclusive content. I will have episodes up early sometimes. I have blog posts. Uh, sometimes I've done things like commentary or just extra episodes that are exclusive just for the Patreon audience. Just want you to know that. But let's take a look at who won a prize this week. Uh, we're going to spin the ball hopper here to see who won. And this week it's going to be, pardon me, number... Number three, so that was this artwork. Ooh, very impressive, thank you so much. And let's take a quick look at what prize you got here. So, gotcha, gotcha, home. And it is going to be what? Um, 
Oh, it's definitely something along the lines of uh, Masked Rider or, no, you know what? Ultraman. This is Ultraman. So, gonna get your contact information and send that your way, and uh, let's keep moving on with the show. Darwin Cook spoke often about the problems that he perceived within the comics industry. He's talked about how he believes that in the 1970s, a lot of comic book fans, superhero fans really, started working in the industry and started writing more for each other than for the all-ages audience, and that aged up what superhero stories became. Now, before that, there were genres for all different ages and audiences, kind of like there are in other countries. Certainly in Europe and Japan, they write different types of stories for other ages. But even in American comics, we used to have way more crime comics, romance comics, sci-fi comics, and now it all became superhero comics written for an older audience. I do basically agree with him. I think that sometimes there's an excuse for a more adult superhero story, but in general, those are morality plays and power fantasies that work best for an all-ages audiences. Adults can appreciate them, but let's make them appropriate for kids and focus our efforts on expanding other genres within comics. So it makes it interesting that he actually worked with DC on some Watchmen comics, and Watchmen was Alan Moore's deconstruction of superheroes in a real world, which came with more sex and violence. How do we reconcile that? Well, I personally don't have a great explanation for that, so I'm going to close out this episode with a quote from Darwin Cook himself discussing these uh, Watchmen comics that he gave to Rolling Stone. I had to make a decision when I got into this. I never had to stop and think, how am I going to honor Alan Moore with this? How am I going to morally resolve this? What I had to do was morally resolve being in the business at all. And that's because I don't consider Alan and David any worse treated than Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster or Jack Kirby or dozens and dozens of other people that were involved in this industry. So as I went into it, understanding all of that, I thought, well, how can I make my peace with it? I made a very deliberate and very conscious decision the day I got involved with this business to honor the work that came before me and to respect the work of the men that had come before me. I can't give the Siegel and Schusters what they deserve, and I certainly can't give Alan Moore what he deserves or what he thinks he should get out of this. That's all beyond my power. But what I can do is have respect for what he's done and try my best to live up to that.